Hello everybody et bienvenue à notre épisode de Donc Voilà Quoi, le podcast où je parle avec mes potes comiques. Cette fois-ci, c'est un épisode très spécial parce que c'est en anglais. Bon, avant que vous arrêtez votre iPod, euh, il faut savoir que bon, c'est un humoriste américain, donc je n'avais pas le choix. Euh, c'est un humoriste bien connu aux états unis ça fait 30 ans euh, qu'il fait ce métier. D'ailleurs, euh, il a fêté ses 30 ans ici à Paris parce que je l'ai emmené ici pour jouer deux spectacles exceptionnels euh, au saut gymnase et ça s'est très bien passé. Et donc j'ai eu l'occasion d'échanger de, de podcast. En fait, moi j'ai fait son podcast à lui et lui il a fait le mien. Et oui, effectivement, c'est exceptionnel que ce soit en anglais. Mais honnêtement, je pense que un français qui parle un peu, non, qui parle pas, qui comprend un peu, peut vraiment comprendre ce, cette euh, discussion. Parce que vraiment, euh, il, surtout lui, il parle assez lentement. Bon, à mon avis, c'est très intéressant d'écouter quelqu'un qui a beaucoup de métiers, qui a quasiment tout fait. Il a, il a fait le tour du monde euh, en faisant du stand-up. Il a eu aux états unis euh, son, son propre sitcom sur NBC et il a fait vraiment tous les, les grands euh, late night shows comme Letterman, il a eu euh, plusieurs spéciales sur Comedy Central et donc c'est très intéressant. Donc je vous conseille de faire l'effort d'écouter Tom Rhodes et moi. Bonne écoute. So I have the pleasure to be here with Tom Rhodes in Paris who's been touring uh, the world and he uh, just performed last night and the uh, Sunday before his full show we we're lucky very lucky to have him here and it was a great uh, great show both shows uh, wonderful time Merci, I was really happy mon frère. <laughs> very happy to be able to mon crayon uh, est jeune. <laughs> got a very good laugh that that's all I got out of my <laughs> high school French class well, it's normal you, you took French in the United States of America so so you, you are touring the world and have been for years I, what, what I was amazed with is that uh, you don't have a home you don't have an apartment like anywhere you don't have one place that you go back to you're just constantly on the road no pun intended I win, right? Yeah. <laughs> that means uh, yeah. my life is a victory. I mean, you, you are living the dream of well, one of my fantasies and probably one of the fantasies of many comics. Um, I think it was summer 2006, end of 2006. I put everything into storage. Yeah. Where were you at that time? Uh, Los Angeles. So yeah. I still have a storage unit in Los Angeles where all my stuff is. Yeah. And I stop by there once or twice a year and dump things yeah. that I've picked up in my travels. Yeah. It looks like a National Geographic <laughs> storage closet with, you know, Peruvian blankets and um, didgeridoos and yeah. things like that. I don't have any didgeridoos. <laughs> I think it's a cool word to use it, in a sentence. It, it, it is definitely um, cool. But yeah, I, I was paying rent on a place I was never at. Yeah. You know, I lived in Amsterdam for five years and I threw everything into storage when I moved to Amsterdam. And then I moved back to Los Angeles after Amsterdam, and I looked around and I thought, you know, what am I protecting? This yeah. is my empire of $20 purchases. Yeah. The things that only really meant anything to me were books and CDs, and, you know, people don't even use CDs anymore. Yeah. You know, you can have your own whole music collection on an iPod. So uh, I condensed my storage, or my belongings even more. I gave away... Uh, furniture, yeah. you know, to comedians in Los Angeles that I knew. <laughs> comedians in need. Yeah. It's an association you know, of comedians. This guy needs a TV, need. this guy yeah, needs course. a couch, you yeah. know. Hey, come by and pick up this coffee table, otherwise I'm going to put it out on the street. Yeah. And I condensed my, you know, belongings to, um, you know, things that were really personal to me and photos and family things and career memorabilia. And um, instead of living in one place I live everywhere yeah and uh, was it difficult to kind of put like uh, strip your life down to the essentials no it was easier the second time when I moved to Europe and put everything in the storage I just kept everything yeah and then when I got everything out I was like why am I saving all this crap yeah so uh, it was easier I mean now I, I think it'll be really interesting when I eventually do get things out of storage and see what electronics that I saved <laughs> because the world has taken a yeah. huge 
jump in technology in the last yeah it's amazing I, I had like a video camera not even that old I mean like from 2006 with cassettes that I and, and I I don't know what to do with that camera anymore like there's there's nothing and the cassettes I don't even know like I have tons of footage of something on these what eight uh, what was it called um, HD cassettes like yeah. little one you know and you can't you'd have to buy a like cassette player to play anything you well know? you can you have to pay to get it converted I used to use a yeah thing like that yeah and uh, yeah it's pricey yeah it's like thirty bucks to yeah but, and it's things. not even ten years old this thing you right. know so. Um, I got into the international circuit of gigs many years ago. Thanks to Amsterdam? No, thanks to London. Okay. Once I got in with London, and I, I started making a lot of trips. I was living in New York City, and I started making a, a lot of trips over to London, and doing sets, and showcasing, and sleeping on friends' couches. And then I got in with the Comedy Store, and I was playing the Comedy Store regularly, and a lot of international gigs are booked out of London. So yeah. I started, once I got in with London, that led to gigs all over Europe, Amsterdam, Paris. There's, there's shows all over Europe. And then also um, gigs in Asia and in Australia. And uh, London was the key to everything. Well, why, why leave the States? Why? Why did? What was the first? What was the thing that pushed you already just to leave the states? Which is already something many comics don't ever do. I'd already played everywhere innumerable times. Yeah, and you know, once you've been to a city like sixteen times, you've seen their arch or their bridge or you know, uh, whatever they have to offer. So it wasn't necessarily a career thing. It was it was your personal desire to see something else. I always loved to you. travel, and I always um, I had had a lot of success in my career. Yeah. Uh, in my 20s to early 30s and just I uh, thought it was the natural progression of things. Yeah. And then also um, I think it's really challenging to be able to make different people laugh. If you're only funny in one region you're not that funny. You're just funny to your own neighborhood, your yeah. own country. Yeah. Um, when I lived in San Francisco in the 90s uh, there was a gay club did I because gay comics didn't do and you think San Francisco is so progressive that they're I thought everybody would just do the regular clubs yeah. there was a gay club and I would do sets there sometimes and then in Oakland there was a black club yeah. and I would do sets there and then uh, sometimes there would be Latino shows around the Bay Area and I always thought it was a real strength as a comedian to be able to go on and make anybody laugh and you were playing all those rooms yeah yeah yeah, that is uh, because you know, I mean we have a tendency to categorize comics and kind of, and I guess comics naturally they're like okay well this is my audience and I'm going to just work on that audience and just be that kind of comic and don't really necessarily branch out and so definitely yeah it is a right a and now I'm strength. at a hyperspace level of that where you know you, it's different in every country you yeah. got to adjust I'm just coming from Holland before I was in France so I mean I have a lot of jokes about Dutch people and Dutch culture from living there yeah. And then, uh, well, I actually have a lot of material on France because the first love of my adult life was with a Parisian. Yeah. I was maced the first time <laughs> I came to Paris. Uh, maced in the City of Love, I think, is a country song waiting to happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I've, I've got a lot of observations on, on, on France and my experiences here. So... But, you know, there's just certain things that don't work in other countries. Yeah. Like references. Yeah. It can be very specific sometimes. Yeah. And I think that's exciting. For me, that's exciting. That's that, that, that moment of fear of, oh, shit, I'm going to lose this 10-minute hunk. Yeah. Because you know certain things are universally funny. And do you try to avoid those things? I mean, like, what, why, do you, why do you start on that 10-minute chunk if you know it's not going to work with that audience that's right in front of you? Uh, I mean, I mean, there's like there's like the, the jokes about France or things I talked about, like the the dog shit motorcycle, yeah. which they don't even have in Paris yeah, anymore. anymore yeah. But I saw it like ten years ago, yeah. and it was a guy on like a souped up dirt bike, BMX bike, and uh, it was a big suction vacuum <laughs> on the back of the motorcycle, and the guy just just <laughs> zipped around <laughs> Paris, vacu vacuuming vacuum up, up shit. dog shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not going to work anywhere else. Yeah. You know, people. Well, you you didn't get laughs because of it was the like French people. French all people all, remember. Yeah, well, of course, all, all of them knew, and it was kind of like they got a kick out of it because they hadn't, probably hadn't thought about that in years. Yeah, I talked to a French guy after the show, and he goes, "It's funny you remember that because that was during the Jacques Chirac yeah, presidency, very, yeah. and then whoever was next got rid of it immediately." Yeah, Sarkozy was the next. 
Uh-huh. So um, Jacques Chirac thought that was an interesting. <laughs> but I think I, mean, I think that it's really exciting to go to different countries and be able to make people laugh. Yeah, and then you do find out what's universally funny in your material. Well, I mean, you you do a mix of things that are universally funny, but also very specific to each country that you have in the audience because you've been everywhere. Like uh, you know, the example being like whether there was someone from Malaysia on Sunday night. And you had a joke about Malaysia. I mean, no, you know, I don't know many comics that yeah, I can, are I, able to do that. I talked about their comedy scene, which yeah. is Malay, Muslim, Indian, uh, Hindu people, and Chinese people, and yeah. that's their comedic uh, comedy scene. is is the same as their uh, ethnic population, and the comedians there ruthlessly make fun of each other's religions and ethnicity. Yeah. So I think they're more free in the United States. For me, that's the most exciting part of the show. My favorite audiences are multinational and multi-ethnic. Yeah. And, you know, well-informed, of course. So when I ask, is there anyone from a different country in the audience, like the first night, there was people from Spain and yeah. Italy, and I think it's really exciting because I've got a lot of stories and jokes about these different countries because I've been uh, all over and experienced a lot of things. So I've never been to Africa, but I did date a Kenyan uh-huh. woman for a short period. Yeah. So you know, if someone that that is almost like going to Kenya. So if someone does, <laughs> so if someone from Africa pops yeah. up in the audience. Yeah. You know, I usually go to my uh, Kenyan. Uh, the the girl I dated from Kenya when we would go on dates, she would insist on running alongside the car <laughs> because uh, you know they're all warming up for marathons <laughs> and stuff. And a lot of African names begin with an N. Yeah. Her name was N. Jerry. N. J. E. R. I. Yeah. N. Jerry. Tom. <laughs> N. Jerry. So, you yeah. know, uh, I, 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 I love that. I love, and then I, I love people thinking, oh, this American is about to be in hot water. Yeah. If he's going to ask what countries, you know, yeah. someone will think, oh, certainly he doesn't. No, I'm German. Yeah. He's not going to have something on Germany. Yeah, you know. And Occasionally, I do get stumped. Well, I mean, you must get stumped if sometimes. It's I mean. Uruguay of or course, yeah. uh, you know Macedonia. Yeah. Um, but I have ways of 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 getting out of that. Yeah. Uh, is there rooms that like? Is there a country that that has been awful that like that that your humor has not worked? Uh, is is there any one place that really gave you a hard time? What's the hardest scene, pretty much, is the question. I don't know what the hardest scene is. I had a horrendous show once at the Edinburgh Comedy Festival. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even a part of the festival. I was just visiting. Yeah. And it was uh, August 2000, before September 11th. Yeah. And uh, it was an anti-American yeah, evening. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, this guy, Louis Schaefer was hosting okay. and a lot of people had gone there just to heckle Louis Schaefer and it turned into this I mean and the Gilded Balloon is notoriously a place where people would go because the, the, the show started at midnight okay uh, it was like a, a, a gig, extra gig people would do for pocket money not yeah. really part of the know, main, official yeah. part of the program so uh, it was all these American comedians and it just turned into this anti-American rally. Yeah. And uh, these people notoriously go there to heckle the comedians. And I, I know a lot of British comedians that wouldn't even do it because yeah. the it's it's notoriously brutal. Why well, people are just really shit faced. Get drunk and yeah. go there to yell at comedians. Yeah. And my good friend Rich Hall was supposed to headline the thing. Yeah. He mysteriously got laryngitis. Uh huh. And he asked me if I would cover his closing set. Yeah. And me being the uh, cocky, arrogant prick that I am, I thought they're going to love me. Yeah. And uh, I drank a lot of beers to yeah. get, you know, my liquid courage. Yeah. And uh, I went out there, and the sound man fucked me before I even got to the microphone. Uh-huh. He played God Bless America. Okay, yeah. As I was walking to the... And I'm not a flag waver at all. Of course, yeah. And this anti-American audience just even turned more rabid. Yeah. And I couldn't even get started. Well, the sound guy probably was on their side. Exactly. Was like, Having a, yeah. you know, probably up there, you know, um, with his pants off masturbating yeah. to this brilliant 
fucking American maneuver he just did. Yeah. Uh, so people are just screaming, fuck you, and go back to America. And uh, I had this really serene moment where I sat down Indian style on the stage and I just lit a cigarette. Yeah. And I just soaked in this this scene is I can still picture it like a movie scene it's like and an just ocean of hatred all these <laughs> ugly contorted faces just screaming just full of fucking hate yeah. fuck you and go back to America and the spittle coming out of their mouth yeah. and uh, and then I, I, I tried to start and uh, whatever joke I chose I, well, first of all I say I go, look I have a drinking problem just let me stay up here long enough to, to earn free drinks <laughs> that got a smattering of laughter yeah but uh, then whatever joke uh, I tried to start with was the wrong choice. And it was just a complete disaster. Yeah. And I mean, I wasn't even a part of the show. I was yeah. covering for my friend who supposedly had <laughs> laryngitis. And I've, Now you I've, know why he had laryngitis. I've heard from different people that uh, Rich has pulled the laryngitis trick a few okay. times yeah. when he didn't feel like going on. And, um, you know, you never forget the, the the sets that fucking hurt your feelings the most. I mean, I, I know it wasn't necessarily me. Yeah, it was the fact that I was American. Yeah. But cut to five years later, I'm in Atlanta, headlining at the Punchline, which is one of my favorite clubs in America. Yeah, and they treat you really nice. They give you a suite at the Hilton. Oh, nice. And I'm starting my day in Atlanta, waking up two three in the afternoon. I'm in my underwear, yeah. having some coffee, and I turn on CNN, and Old Town Edinburgh, Scotland is engulfed in flames and they're showing the map of this old town center of Edinburgh and everything is destroyed in the fire and I remember that's where that club is. So I'm by myself in my hotel room in Atlanta in my underwear and I stood up and went. <laughs> so I'm glad the motherfucker burned to the ground. Yeah. Doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> They've rebuilt it, but yeah. you know that. Well, you that is it. the worst show. Yeah, that I've I, I, well, I'm, ever I'm not. Been a part of. I'm not surprised that it was in the in the United and Kingdom. Then a, then a year uh, and two months later, everyone's shoulder to shoulder and loving Americans and all that. Yeah. It's, uh you can see the climate. Yeah. Of, well, of what was what was going on. I mean, I was. I had just moved to Amsterdam and I'm living in Europe and I mean there was a really ugly anti-American anti -American yeah. thing and so now since you're traveling to this the day world, even now I think that anti-Americanism is the only prejudice that is tolerated in the world and specifically Europe yeah you can hear people they write you know the, the opinion articles you hear people talk shit about Americans all the time and everyone else is oh don't you know you can't say this about a certain culture yeah. and that, but the, the one that's coming up now is China. People are, at least in France, people are, you know, there's kind of carte blanche on, on making fun of China. You can really say whatever you want, Chinese, you know, because they're taking over the world. That's, that's the whole, like, you know, reason to make fun of them. And that's pretty much it. Like, you can make fun of whoever's ruling the world, is, right. the, is the idea, you know. Well, and, I'm glad that uh, we got a little break there <laughs> for a while. Yeah. And so, well, as, as, since, travel, since you're traveling the world, you do feel it. Uh, I mean, was was that the no no no? I mean, back, back then when back Bush then, yeah. was president, and then during the the second Gulf War, yeah, especially in England, you know, yeah. baby killer people like what? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I I didn't kill any stand up babies. comedian. Yeah. I haven't killed any babies. Yeah, um, but no, now things are mu things are great. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, it was more brave to be an American playing around the world in those years. Yeah. When people would automatically lump you as some Republican Bush loving moron, yeah, you know. Um, but now, now it's cakewalk. Yeah, and so now it's been eight years that you've been having your stuff in storage and traveling. Uh, I mean, I've been traveling the world since two thousand nine, no ninety eight, ninety nine. Oh wow! Yeah, so fifteen years. But yeah, and that, and because I was traveling the world. And out of the country for half the year, I just thought, you know, why am I paying rent on a place I'm yeah. never at? And so what was the London to Amsterdam leap? How did that happen? I fell in love with a Dutch girl. Who you met in London? No, I met in Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, the very first time I went to Amsterdam. Yeah. And um, I thought it was a magical place. And uh, I was coming off of my sitcom which was 96 to 97 and uh, that was a frustrating experience 
I, 98, 99, I'm living in New York City, and I just, I got really swept up in partying. Well, what, what happened with, the, with that, with the, <coughs> with the sitcom? NBC, what did NBC tell you? It was on NBC, right? Yeah. I mean, what did, they, did they promise you something? Did they say, like, this is going to be your show? I mean, did they want you to write for it? And No, they didn't give you a deal to develop, to develop a show, but... Um, based on your stage character? Based on your yeah, persona? Yeah, but it yeah. turned out to be have nothing to do with me. Yeah. And uh, they took a few of my jokes for the pilot. Okay. NBC was defending me. Their notes every week was more Tom, more Tom. We don't, we're not seeing the guy that we signed. Yeah. So to NBC's credit, yeah, uh, they were they NBC they were felt the exact same way I did. Yeah. Where is the 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 Tom we fell in love with? And that was the the uh, tug of war I was having with the executive producer, like. Okay. You know this. This the, the, they would have. I had really long hair, so everybody would. It was all hair jokes. Yeah. Directed at me, and then they, he wouldn't let me retort. Yeah. The script would say Tom reacts. Now, how many times yeah. can you just shrug? Yeah, of course. When someone says something shitty to you, of course. And I would go talk to this guy and go, look, anyone I ever considered a hero, did not. Someone did not better them uh, in wits, and I'm. Uh, you know, uh, in in uh, comedic beast, I crush people like bugs yeah. who say things to me and heckle. Yeah. Um, the focus became on the kids, and uh, you know, it, it's it's good that that thing didn't last because it didn't uh, represent who I was. But when it finished, I was angry at humanity and yeah. show business, and I moved to New York to get back into stand up. But I, which I did, and I was doing five six sets a night in New York going from taxi to stage but yeah. I got really um, into the party and I'd never you know never had done hard drugs before like yeah. cocaine and stuff I'd just been like a weed guy um, but I, I think I didn't care what, what was it was it was it kind of the anger coming out of the NBC was it the rhythm of performing uh, so no, much no was no no I mean I, I the, the I, people I, you're hanging out with was well like show business went ice cold on me yeah. a lot of people I thought were my good friends stopped taking my phone call yeah so uh, was that true for comics fellow comics or people in the like television industry uh, across the board okay and uh You know, and it, it wasn't my dream to be a, a, a sitcom star. My dream was to be a stand-up comedian. Yeah. So I moved back to just get into the pure scene. Yeah. And then from there, I was like, you know, I want to do gigs around Europe. Yeah. And uh, London primarily, and uh, started making systematic trips over. And then that led to to the other gigs. Yeah. So and, and then I, I I go to Amsterdam and I just uh, the the Dutch culture and and this girl that I fell in love with kind of made me love life again. Yeah, um, riding bikes and you know and the Dutch kind of going back to simplicity actually. Yeah, I think it was yeah. a total simplicity thing. Yeah, and it was a beautiful summer and I'm you know was riding boats on the canals, eating strawberries and drinking champagne and yeah. lounging around Vondel Park. Uh, it was just you know I I started to to uh, my anger started to dissipate. Yeah. Did you ever have that feeling that like you were missing out on something by spending so much time in Europe? Well, I still went back and did because I wanted to keep my American comedy muscle strong. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to completely give up on American stand up, so I went back to clubs that I play every year, like San Francisco, Atlanta, Chicago, and I'd go to L. A. and Uh, do the ice house and the improv and things like that, but I think there was a perception of people thinking I had fucked off to Europe. Yeah, they, they kind of like wrote you off because you were. Or I just thought you know he's I don't know not available or whatever. And yeah. I I did see a lot of I mean I still see it a lot of you know younger comedians do having you know big TV opportunities and all these things. Um, I think I might have missed. A lot of opportunities, but um, I'm uh, I wouldn't trade that life that I had living in Europe for anything. Yeah, because then I had this late night talk show on Dutch television, and then after that I got to do this travel show. That was pretty quickly, pretty early on, right? What your time in in, uh, in the in the Netherlands that you got proposed uh, this com uh, this uh, talk show. I, I was there for two years. Oh, two years already. Okay. And then the girl and I had broken up. Yeah. And then I was about to move back to the States. And yeah. it is kind of storybook the way it happened. 
Uh, I mean, like you wouldn't believe it if you saw it in a movie. It's like, yeah. you know, oh, you're all heartbroken and you're going to move back to the States and then somebody sees you in a comedy club and they just happen to be looking for an American. Yeah. To, I mean, and that's where it benefited me to be an American. Yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was a fun, you know, glitzy show. I mean, there was a lot of cheesy aspects of it, but the main thing was I was an American experiencing Dutch culture. Yeah. And I, would, I got to make these five-minute films every episode where I would experience something of Dutch culture. Yeah. And uh, that was really fun. I loved it. Yeah. And, and were you, uh, did you feel like you were kind of changing the comedy scene there? Did you feel like you were having an influence on, on the, the Dutch perspective on what comedy is? Did no, uh, I mean, the Dutch comedy scene is unto itself. And they're yeah. very, uh, you know, mama bear protective. They kind of... Is, is it very different? Is it like, uh, or is it very open to international... Kind they of have international comedians come to Holland. I, I guess I, I, a would, lot, I would imagine it's very London. Like, it's, it's very t closely attached to British comedy. Is that true at all? Yeah, I mean a lot. Of comed there's a lot of comedians that come there from from all over the world. Yeah. But um, uh, I don't know. It's th there's kind of there was three different clubs there for a while, and Dutch comedians couldn't play each one. Okay. So even within the Dutch comedy community, it's very segregated. If you yeah. play at one, if you're not of this school, okay, you can't play the other one. Okay. So I mean, it's it's kind of difficult for Dutch comedians in that regard. But now there's um, there's some new places there, and there's a, a mix of Dutch and English language comedy that's happening. Yeah. So I mean, it, I guess it depends which branch you're from in the Dutch comedy world. So it's already pretty rich, even within just the the Dutch comedy world. Like there are different schools, and there are different, I guess, what styles. Uh, I mean. I mean, it's like anywhere. There's yeah. there's there's great comedians there, yeah. and then there's. Uh, Do they export it all? Do I mean I haven't heard of any Dutch comedian. There's a guy Walter Mice who's yeah. living in London. Okay. He's there trying to. He's really funny and dark. And yeah. Twisted. Was there was there um, any problem with you doing your show in English? I mean, I, I guess the Dutch. No, it was subtitled in English, and all of the guests uh, they subtitled in came on and spoke English. I mean, okay. and that show was a testament to how smart Dutch people are. Yeah. Because I mean, the show could be broadcast in English, and and uh, the, all their celebrities could, could come on and be interviewed yeah. in English. I, when I have Dutch people in my audience, I usually say that they speak better English than we do. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Generally, how how good they they speak English, and then Sweden, they're even better than the Dutch. Yeah, and and so now you're uh, just continue going around. Is there like a place that? You you look forward to going to more? Is there any like country that you're like, ah, oh, I have to go there because I got a good gig, but I don't want to? Or is like, or is every country just a new? Are you happy to go every every time you, you move? I'm pretty you selective. I uh, you know Paris. I was really looking forward to. I'm a yeah. Francophile. Yeah, I love French culture. The culture, yeah, and uh, you know everything. The wine, food, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm turned on by France. And uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, this this tour in Amsterdam, Paris, Barcelona, and then London, and then I go to to L.A., Vegas, Phoenix, Dallas, Atlanta. You know, uh, there's only sometimes will it be a gig where I'm not that excited about going yeah but um the money's great yeah so it's rare it's rare that, it's there's, rare. A, that there's a country that you're like uh i should probably be more money driven because i think i do book most everything on how my pleasure experiences well that's part of the the fun i mean that's that's part of the well, we spent a month travel. in new zealand last year and that was just titillating yeah you know i mean i there's it's so remote and yeah. beautiful and stunning. I love Australia. I love yeah. Australian audiences. Um, are you? Are you? Have you kind <coughs> of created a name for yourself? Like because you've been traveling so long, like for for such a long time, or is it still kind of because of the television you've done in the states? Like, what gets you the gigs? Um, where does your name come from? 
someone from like Australia, for example, of course, in the well, states. Well, like Australia, thing. they're uh, Comedy Central. I've done, I think, like uh, three or four appearances on television. Um, Rove Live used to be their big late night talk show. I don't. Mm-hmm. Think he's not on there anymore. I think he actually has a TV show in the United States now. Yeah, uh, I did his program. Um, so, so you 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 go on to the television. Like you try to go on to the television <coughs> shows of that country, and it kind of helps you get known within that country. Is that how it works? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it was I I played there. That was I had been there a few times before, and then got invited to do you know these television spots. Yeah. I'm going to London in a few weeks, and I just got invited to do this political panel talk show. Yeah. So I got to totally be up on current events. Yeah. You know, I got to just uh, read the just newspaper, know like five different everything newspapers about yeah. the Ukraine protests yeah. and and everything. I mean, uh, I mean, I I uh, I think I should have a bigger name, but I guess I I do have somewhat of a name because I get invited to do various. Definitely. Shows. I mean, the fact, the simple fact that you're able to do what you're doing and tour so many different countries and. And, and make a living out of it is, is proof of, of that, that your name has weight. That, that and also I think Comedy Central has a big part of it because Comedy Central now is on all over the world. Okay, I didn't know that. And I've done uh, two half hour specials yeah. for them and then I have a new hour that's on Netflix. Yeah. So Netflix, uh, we signed a three year deal and it's on in Australia, New Zealand, United States and Canada, England and Ireland and Scandinavia. Yeah. And I'll get messages on my Facebook fan page, you know, um, and you can see that it'll, you know, say like, you know, Oslo or you yeah. know, Copenhagen and next to their name, yeah. if they got their location thing switched on. And it's, I, I think probably that is the, it's the, the power of, of those specials that I've done. Yeah. I, do you find that there's a tendency <coughs> among comics who've kind of... Established themselves in the states and have become a name uh, to now want to go abroad. Is there a kind of a tendency to do more and more European, you know, English-speaking Europe tours? Like I, you know, it seems like I saw Jim Gaffigan is doing, uh, you know, England, Scandinavia, Holland tour. I mean, is is that something recent or? No, I I don't know. I I think uh, who wouldn't want to test the waters? Yeah, and go out, and especially if you got a massive fan base like Jim Gaffigan. Yeah, um, you know he's doing big theaters. Yeah, uh, I'm doing that on a smaller, you know, smaller scale, small theater, big club level. Yeah, I see. And so, yeah, you don't see yourself as kind of a trailblazer in that regard because I don't know if there were many people who did what you. Did you, what? What are you doing? Uh, you know, for so long, and being a comic who really, you know, lots of comics tour the states, but it seems like after a while they get sick of it. Their real goal is to be in one city. Your goal seems to be the opposite, and it seems like it might be inspiring other comics back in the states. Or probably your move to Amsterdam. I, I'm presume, presuming that they might have been like, "Why would you go there when the industry is they here?" They don't speak your language. Yeah, yeah, okay. and and, and saying like, "What sort of career are you going to have there when you know?" You can't be... The States is everything. It's the center of everything. And that, you know, the more comics that do what you're doing might open kind of the, the, the eyes of other comics to say, oh, well, why not? Just for the fun of it, perform in a big Yeah, I don't know if I had anything to do with it. Uh, it kind of reminds me of... Three weeks ago, I was in San Francisco yeah. at the Punchline, uh, another one of my favorite clubs in the world. And when I lived in San Francisco in the 90s... Um, Greg Proops was living there, Margaret Cho, Mark Marin, Patton Oswalt, oh, wow, yeah. uh, Dana Gould, all these brilliant comedians uh, were developing and had moved there kind of as like the graduate school step. They weren't beginners. Yeah. We were, um, you know, at a level trying to go even higher. Yeah. Uh, and some young comedian asked me a few weeks ago when I was in San Francisco, was asking me about this period, and she goes, um, did you know you were a part of history when it was happening? Hmm. I, no, never crossed my mind. I yeah. just thought, you know. You're just doing your scene. My, yeah. you know, friends, comedians, and we're just doing what we love. Did, so, you, did you have an impression that... Uh, did you, you ever have the So you asked me if I influenced people to yeah. travel? I have no fucking idea. Yeah. No one has ever 
said, oh, well, I saw you've been traveling. I thought to do it myself. No one has ever directly said I'll that. I'll have a lot of people ask me how can I get in with yeah. Paris and London and okay. Amsterdam, things like that. Yeah. You know, it's always interesting, like, uh, guys... I was in Cincinnati working with this guy from Indianapolis, and he was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about... I'm going to test the waters in Europe. Uh, I was yeah. wondering if you could give me some contact information okay. for London. Yeah. And... Um, I'm like, uh, have, you, have you gotten in with Chicago yet? Oh, no, no, no. Have you ever gone to Chicago? Oh, no, no, no. Well, Chicago's only an hour and a half up the road from Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. You know, before you go, go conquer the- Europe, <laughs> maybe, you know, conquer you should try state. and get in with Chicago and <laughs> yeah. New York yeah. before, uh, before and, you do that. And uh, if you saw at the time when you were in San Francisco, did you feel... So you didn't feel at all that that like the people you're doing comedy with would go off to be, you know, defining names in the in the in the what's now known as comedy. Did he feel that at the time, or is it just? I thought there was a lot of great work being done. I mean, the guys I just absolutely loved and found inspiring. Yeah, you know, to see Greg Proop's work and Patton Oswalt. I mean, you know, Mark Maron always had like a very self destructive, self hatred thing. You didn't yeah. have to. Um, yeah, he was going to destroy himself. Yeah. He, he didn't have to. Uh, I mean, even even if he tried to help him. Yeah. Um, I mean, and you know, Margaret Cho was wonderful. It was just you know, people coming every week, trying to impress each other with the best thoughts, the most progressive humor, uh, and uh, just well written comedy. Do you feel that someone works better, a comic works better in a scene that's thriving? I think so. I think it did. Like it, that, it, that influences. It, like? it uh, helps you raise your game. Yeah. You know, there was a while where I was I was doing a lot of when I came back from Amsterdam and I was just booking tons of gigs in the states because I wanted to reestablish myself. Didn't want to be forgotten in the states. Yeah. And then you know I'm the headliner, so I was I would only be working with you know younger comedians. Yeah. You know, and they're all asking me for advice and stuff. And you know, I love being the elder statesman with with answers because yeah. I remember being the young starting out, kid, yeah. you know, needing uh, the pearl of wisdom. But um, I wasn't working with guys on my level that were challenging me. Yeah, I mean, and then you you go to comedy festivals. That's what's great about comedy festivals. Um, you know, it's almost like a tennis tennis tournament. You yeah. gotta you gotta turn up with your best. Yeah. Because you're going to be, you know, playing and against guys, the you know, top you know. top players. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel like that you you miss that because you're touring so much that that you don't necessarily? Oh. No, I, I broke that chain. I mean, now I'm like, I just um, there's no sense for me to just do all of anything because I can I can play all these different countries. Yeah. And, and I've got different friends around the world. I've been doing it so long. That's what's great. Yeah. I got. Um, Interesting, smart, funny friends all over the world. And do, do, how much are you still writing? Like, is it still always there? Like, are you st- constantly producing material, testing out material, or do you kind of feel like you've reached a stage where you kind of? I mean, I had this impression. Tell me if you're, I'm wrong, but like that that you've been doing it for so long that you were on stage and you had like a, a library. A bookshelf of jokes behind you. When you were and, watching me here in Paris. Yeah, like, yeah. and and that you've uh, you're able to just you know pull out based like if it's you know for example someone from Malaysia in the audience you pull out a Malaysia joke like th- that you have so much material that you can just kind of pull out what you want when you want to and that that's you have so much that you don't really feel the need to work on more material or is this kind of still an evolutionary process that you're still taking time to write new stuff and test new stuff I mean where like how much percentage of your time is spent writing or, or how much is it performing I don't know if that well your observation is correct I do yeah, have okay. a massive library in yeah. my head and now that I stopped drinking yeah. uh, a month ago <laughs> uh, I've got total recall on stage of, yeah. of jokes and stories um, but uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, I filmed a new hour special. That's the one that's airing on Netflix right uh-huh. now. And then I also recorded a, a new CD. And uh, I, I'm I'm trying to come up with the new hour. Yeah. So I'm I'm. It's different now. You get a little older, and you know, I got it. I got I got my own podcast. I got videos I'm making. I have to travel. I have to. 
It's a lot. Yeah. I have to deliver the goods to a certain degree as the headliner, but I'm I'm trying to you know put in as much new stuff as I can when I can. Yeah. Um, my best thoughts always come from having intelligent conversations with interesting people. Like last night, yeah. uh, the little party we went to, that was great. Yeah. You know, we're in Paris and... You meet people, and you know, some British guy, yeah. Americans, French people. And, and we're just talking about everything. Yeah. And to yeah. me, that's Nirvana. Yeah. You know, I mean, every everybody was drinking and there's some hash joints being passed around and yeah. we're just, you know, it's a little think tank of, of, of uh, intelligent minds. That's and and where creative it, minds, like most of the people are in creative Right, field. so like when, I, when I'm talking to, to smart, funny people, that's where, you know, my brain is, yeah, is popping. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's a slow process. I yeah. mean, I think it takes probably, uh, I mean, I, I did my first live CD in 2000. Yeah. The, the next one came out in 2006 and then the next one after that came out in like 2012 yeah so it seems for me uh like it takes six six years to come up with a new hour yeah well that's been my pattern yeah so um 2018 i guess but but i mean the thing is like uh, the fact that you're traveling seems like you would have less time to work on, on on writing material, you know, uh, as as opposed to someone who's just like I'm gonna, you know, uh, pitch my tents in, in San Francisco. This is my home. All I have to do is perform. You know, he doesn't have to think about getting to the next country. That I would think that he has a, almost an advantage of writing new material because he doesn't have to deal with the things that you have to deal with as someone who's traveling all the time. So I m- imagine that. I mean, I, but also, I guess the flip side is that you have all this experience. Yeah, in my country, I have country the advantage because I'm having more from, experiences yeah. where that guy is living the same life in the same neighborhood. Every and do you feel your joke writing is getting better? Like, like do, you, do you still feel that that your the knife is being sharpened even more? Do you, uh, you like? Do you feel like now when you have an idea, the different the the time between uh, that that idea hits your brain and the time that you actually have a good joke? Is getting shorter and shorter. It's the same as it's always been. You know, okay. it's 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 banging out the sword on the anvil. You know, yeah. you ever see a sword be made? They like got this crude piece of metal and they fucking steam, get it all red hot, and they bang it on the anvil and they put it in the water. And, yeah. Uh, there's a process. I mean, it's just taking it on stage is the anvil. Yeah. And you know, doing it, and then you get it down to an economy of words. Um, uh, you know, uh, th- th- things naturally work themselves out. It seems on stage, but it seems like it takes the same amount of time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I it's th- not like oh, I've got this, you know, fucking wizard, uh, you know, crown. Now I can come up with with jokes instantly. I, I wish I could. Well, I just don't know if, if like the more you do it, the quicker that process becomes. Or not, or if it's just kind of, as you said, just a matter of, of trying it out and kind of doing the same. Uh, well, I mean, I, there's a certain thing that you've built, which is a state of confidence in your art that is a fundamental basis uh, for, for everything that, that you can get up and you can test something out, and that's not a problem for you at all. You know, it doesn't put in, right. in and doubt I'm, anything that, that you've built. I'm, I'm happy that I have so much material. Yeah. And that, like, when I'm, you know, headlining a show, I, I'm lucky I get to normally do, like, an hour every night. Yeah. 45 to an hour. Yeah. That's a lot of time to try new stuff out. I, I call them tent poles. You got the, yeah. the tent poles holding up, uh, you know, in the sag. Yeah. But there's loads of... Um, spots where I leave to be experimental or talk to the crowd and yeah. try something new. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take some time off in pockets and go. I think I might go rent an apartment in San Francisco for a month and just do sets there. Yeah, because the audiences are so intelligent. I always developed material there. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, and and fortunately, I'm I, I'm I do well enough in my career. I make good enough money where I can do that. Yeah. I can take a month off and go live in the city of my choice yeah. and just work on material. So, uh, and who, who puts those uh, goals? Do you, do you put them that's personally? Me. It's, okay. it's explicitly me. I okay. mean, you know, my favorite thing is, and it's why I became a comedian, uh, is to do comedy specials and comedy recordings. Yeah. And so, 
you know, I just did the last one not long ago. So I, now I really have the hunger and the desire to come up with a new hour. Yeah. So that's what puts that in my mind. I'm, you know, closing every night. You got a certain job to do. Yeah. But um, I, uh, I, I have enough uh, money to to think like an artist, and that's great. And uh, you know, work. Uh, Work on the sword and bang it out on the anvil. Do you have any uh, goals, uh, like anything that that you still want to accomplish that you haven't done? I've been working on a book for the last uh -huh. couple of years. Uh, my best stories, traveling, and you know all the stuff that I've done. Co comedy, like you use yeah, just my life as yeah. a comedian, starting well, well, out young one. and doing the road, yeah. uh, southern circuits, all this wild shit that I yeah. saw, and guns pulled on people, huh. and um, you know, and then. Moving to San Francisco, be, you know the Comedy Central days and uh, the sitcom, and you know New York, living in Amsterdam. I've had a pretty full life, so yeah. um, I think everybody's got one great book in them. I think I have a, a seriously it sounds like your life is already a great <laughs> uh, motherfucker in, in my book. Yeah, uh, and then there's the comedy travel show. Yeah, that I want to be the Anthony Bourdain of comedy. I want to. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's my life basically I want to um, check out comedians from uh, check out comedy scenes in different countries and yeah. highlight comedians from those countries yeah. so I mean those are my goals and still just um, stay relevant that's yeah. the most important thing as a comedian you, you just want to stay relevant you don't want to you don't want to be doing the same act years from now and yeah. somebody you know ah yeah god I used to be a fan of that guy I yeah want, You know, I want I want to I want to change people's lives when they come and see me. Yeah, I want well, them to never forget the experience. Yeah. There, there are lots of comics I feel who do the same thing, you know, same routine that they have for a long time. And that's death. Uh, yeah, it seems like comedy's it. like salmon. If you're not moving forward, yeah. you're fucking dead. Yeah. Uh, any any piece of advice for anybody starting now, to perhaps a French comic who understands English who uh, might be listening? Who well, you know, the, there's no shortcut. In comedy, yeah, and young comedians always ask me, you know, what for advice and stuff, and it always seems like they want some kind of shortcut. There's yeah. no shortcut. Everybody starts the same. You have got to eat a lot of turd sandwiches <laughs> on stage before you find your voice, before you find what's funny, before you find your natural rhythm, and then even once you become great, there's still a turd sandwich waiting out there for always. you everywhere it feels like I've seen Chris Rock one. eat it yeah. after he's famous yeah. at the comedy cellar in New yeah. York uh, it happens to everybody but when it comes to developing you know those first 10 years are are the most crucial yeah. and uh, the, there's there's no there's no easy way around it you gotta really tough it out yeah. and you gotta suck and you gotta you know and, and that is what Sucking or having a heckler shut you down and embarrass you will make you go home and sit in, with your notebook and just I, force you to write material. I, so some of the most, uh, well, the best writing sessions have been off of a bad set and that have just this anger, that's this it. rage, that's the greatest this motive. rage that's just like because you know you can be a better comedian yeah. and you're not there yet, yeah. and that will force you to work harder at it. And that's the greatest advice I can. I can give just you know sounds, just keep getting on stage yeah sounds good to me and then one day you're going to be a fire breathing dragon <laughs> and you're going to step on stage and everyone is going to lose rank and title you're the yeah. fucking sheriff yeah. and nobody has got a bigger gun than you but I have a feeling even when you get to that point as you said you know you're going to still continue eating turd sandwiches it still happens <laughs> yeah yeah Still happens. But I guess you could become such a master that you see it for what it is. And <laughs> well, and then you've got different gears. When you're starting out, you've only got first gear. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. you're just, that's all you just step on gas and brake, is yeah. all you know. Yeah. But when you've been doing it a long time, you can shift gears. Yeah. So if you are eating a turd sandwich, oh, they're not liking the personal stuff, I'll talk about some social things. So yeah. if that's not working, let's uh, try some one liners. Yeah. Personal stories, whatever. I mean, you got different gears on your automobile yeah so who, who, I don't know if this might be a weird question who's your favorite comic is there a comic that 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 you think is uh, that you hold as a kind of idol 
I don't know. I don't know because dead. I'm I mean, friends with most everyone. Yeah. So I mean, I don't look at. I mean, it people. could be even Lenny. You know, Lenny Bruce, someone not even. Yeah, I, I I I loved Lenny, but I mean, he wasn't that funny. Yeah. I mean, no, he had some great bits. No, I'm just saying as he, an example, so it could be someone who and a lot of this stuff personally. doesn't hold up. I mean, I loved Pryor as yeah. a kid, but yeah. I mean, those, those a lot of those albums don't, don't hold, hold up. up. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Murphy's Delirious still holds up, still mm. hilarious. Yeah. Um, but as far as contemporary comedians, I'm friends with most everybody, so yeah. I wouldn't put them in an idol category. But yeah. uh, guys that I love, yeah. uh, Steve Hughes uh-huh. is brilliant. Jimmy Carr, one of my favorites. Dave Vitell yeah. is a beast. Uh, Doug Stanhope. Yeah. Uh, Dave Chappelle. And I mean, I know all these guys, yeah, but they inspire me. Yeah. And I, I look at them, and uh, especially like stuff that Stanhope is doing now. Yeah. And, uh, and Steve Hughes, I just go, wow, it just makes you, because also they're your friends. Yeah. And you don't ever want to feel like an inferior. Yeah. So uh, that also will inspire you to to lift your game and, and yeah. write more um, multi-layered, um, you know. It forces you to push yourself further. Well, I mean, and something more than jokes, something with like an ideology or a belief yeah. a principle behind yeah. your humor. I mean, I always thought the best kind of humor you learn something from. Yeah. Was, that, was that always the case? Or is that kind of coming now out of... No, that was always my favorite kind of humor. Yeah. Things you could learn from. Yeah. I love your joke, uh... And then, uh, and then we'll have to hate someone for the person they are. Is <laughs> mix the races, baby. You, 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 you get an applause. I imagine. I mean, you got applause both nights. That's I imagine you get an applause every every time. It's pretty a, much. It's I mean, that's wonderful. an older joke of mine I did years ago. Yeah. And then I I brought it back yeah. in recent years. It's still. I mean, number up. one it's because uh, my wife is a dark skinned woman. Yeah. Um, but because it's it, people still need to hear it. Yeah. And that there is such a it's, divide it's between races, yeah. and that if we mix the races uh, and we're all the same shade, then you can hate someone for the person they are. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking Sebastian, the time. Thank you so much, and for, thanks for, for coming, baking me a cake, and <laughs> putting thirty candles on it for the thirtieth yeah, anniversary of pleasure. me being a stand-up comedian. I'm glad that I spent my thirtieth anniversary as a comedian with you in Paris. Wow, well, it's a great honor to have you here. Shalom, amigo. <laughs> Voilà la fin de notre conversation. Euh, j'espère que vous avez compris au moins 90% de ce qu'on a dit. Peut-être third sandwich était dur là. Ouais, ça c'était un peu dur, third sandwich. Mais euh, bon, j'espère que ça, ça vous a plu. Si c'est le cas, n'hésitez pas à aller sur le, ah, le page face, Facebook, dire. Facebook et euh, vous abonner sur iTunes où vous voulez. D'ailleurs, si vous avez raté son spectacle, euh, je vous conseille de liker la page de New York Comedy Night, qui est la soirée que j'anime tout le vendredi, parce que c'est là où euh, je mets euh, toute l'information euh, sur tous les humoristes euh, étrangers qui viennent nous rendre visite ici à Paris. On va avoir très bientôt euh, Greg Proops en mai, euh, aussi un autre artiste qui s'appelle Al Lubel, très drôle aussi. Il a fait Edinburgh, il est à Amérique. Et donc, euh, on a de plus en plus de, de, des humoristes euh, anglophones euh, que j'emmène ici à Paris. Donc, si vous voulez voir ces gens-là, likez la page New York Comedy Night ou si vous voulez envoyer moi un mail, je, je peux vous mettre sur le mailing list. Parce que vraiment, ce, ce genre de, de spectacle, euh, c'est vraiment un honneur vraiment de les avoir ici à Paris, surtout dans un, 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 une petite salle comme le Soul Gymnase. Donc je vous conseille fortement si vous voulez, à, à, au lieu d'aller à New York, c'est moins cher de venir au Soul Gymnase pour ce genre de, de spectacle. Merci beaucoup et à la prochaine. Bisous.